So in chapter four, we're going to talk about dynamics, timbre, and then basic form or organization. So when we talk about dynamics, we're really talking about how loud the music is or how quiet the music is. Uh, not soft. Your book says the, the loud and soft of music. Soft is like a pillow. It's a bad term. So think of it like quiet. Now in music, we have to have descriptions and symbols to tell players how loud to play something relatively. It does no good, and, and when music started out, uh, um, they didn't have this technology to measure, but it would do no good to tell somebody, hey, play this at 75 decibels. That is a measurement of, of loudness, but we don't know how to actually measure that with our own ears. Most people couldn't do that. What we have are Italian symbols that are, and you'll find them in your book, by the way, page 27, okay? There's a table there. You'll find like a scrolled F or a P like that. This stands for the word forte, which means loud. And this stands for the word piano, which means quiet. And these were the basic terms that they would mark in the music in the early days, and even today, to let musicians to know whether they're playing them loud, you know, playing the notes loud or quietly. Now, you can temper this if you put an M in front of either of these. The term that goes with that is mezzo. It's spelled M-E-Z-Z-O or Z-Z-O for you Canadian people. I am one, but it's not mezzo, it's mezzo. So mezzo forte, this means medium, medium loud. Mezzo piano means quiet, but not as quiet as really quiet. So you can temper it that way. You can also double up your F, F, or P, P. And when you do that, you add on Isimo to the end. So this was forte, but two of these would be fortissimo. This was piano, but two of them would be pianissimo. And that just means much more of whatever it is you're talking about. So forte is loud, fortissimo is very loud, piano is quiet, pianissimo, two Ps, would be really quiet. You have a table on page 27 in your book, and it has uh, the following information on it. If you're looking at your book or you look afterwards, it has the term, okay, like forte, okay? Then it has the symbol, like that, which would be an F. And then it has the meaning or the definition, okay, which is loud. And then it has the pronunciation, okay? Now, on your test, you should be able to do the following tasks. If I give you any one of these pieces of information, you should be able to supply me with the corresponding symbol or term or definition, okay? Or if I gave you um, a bunch of these together, like forte and that one and that one right there, you could put them in order of loudest to quietest or quietest to loudest. You could sort them out. So any piece of information, gives you the other, either definition, term, or symbols, or you should be able to order these from quiet to loud or loud to quiet, and have a general idea of what they mean. There are two other terms and, uh, and accompanying symbols and things in the book underneath the table that, well, three, three, I guess, that you should know. One has a symbol that looks like this, and it also has um, a written out symbol, that looks like this, okay? It stands for crescendo, or sometimes you'll see an opening hairpin, and it means to get louder. So rather than just going from quiet to loud like that, it means to do it in a gradual way, okay? And then the opposite, closing, it's got this for your symbol. Either one of these, you'll see this sometimes, or you'll see that sometime. They're both considered the symbol the term is decrescendo for this one, and it means to get quieter, okay? So, symbol, opening hairpin, crescendo, or crest. Symbol, closing hairpin, decrest. The term is crescendo, decrescendo. The meaning or the definition is to get louder and to get quieter, and we'll see that in music as well. And then one last term that's still there underneath there, it's called subito, and it means quite suddenly, quite suddenly, without warning. And so, um, sometimes you'll see it like this, 
or sometimes you'll even see it like this, subito piano, to become very quietly, uh, very quiet very quickly. So again, term, definition, and symbol, you should know all those. Now on page 27, there's another term in your book. Let's just get the pronunciation correct to begin with. It's not timbre, it's not timbre, it's timbre, timbre, okay? So it's like the word amber, but with a T at the beginning, okay? Your book goes through a very lengthy uh, discovery and discussion of what timbre is. We're gonna simplify this for you. Timbre means color in music, okay? And what we mean by that is, if you have um, a piano play a note, and it's the same dynamic level and the same note, and the same location as, say, a flute playing the same note, or a trumpet playing the same note, or even somebody singing, you'll be able to tell them apart from each other because they have a different intrinsic color. You can have wide changes in color, or timbre, because of the way that the sound is actually made. For instance, um, if you have something that strikes a wire, like the piano, that's going to make a different sound completely than, say, a trumpet, which is air vibrating through lips that then is amplified and smoothed out in a brass instrument. Um, so what makes the sound, first off, determines color, and then the differences in the quality of uh, the materials. For instance, a well-made trumpet versus a very poorly made trumpet. The materials, the engineering, the actual metal itself and the thickness and its qualities will also give um, differences in color and adjustment. And finally, the expertise of the player. Uh, you can have two players play the same instrument. One will sound much better than the other. And that has to do with color or timbre. It's their technique. Okay? And that's all you really need to know. It's going to become relevant because um, your listening test will have you distinguish between different timbres or colors. In other words, I'll play some music for you and you'll need to know whether it's woodwinds, brass, percussion, or strings. So you're actually listening for color or timbre. So now we're going to talk about form, which is the last big topic for chapter four. Form has to do with not how one individual note goes, but how groups of notes go to make entities, recognizable themes, chord progressions, and sections. And then after a section is done, then what does the next one look like or sound like in relation to the first one and so on. Form is important. Uh, a lot of people don't think about that in music until something goes wrong in form because we get caught up in the moment of the sounds or the lyrics or whatever it is that you like about the music. But if you think about form from the visual arts or, or from fabric arts or something like that, if you were trying to draw a tree, but you got the shape of it wrong, the proportions of it all wrong, then it wouldn't look like a tree no matter how great your color was or how good the shading was or the detail of the moss on it or the bark or something like that. If it didn't look like a tree in shape or form, people would say, what is that, a shrub? Is that a, you know, an animal? Is it something? They wouldn't know what it was. Similarly, if you think about form in clothing, uh, form leads to function. If you're trying to make a shirt and it only has one arm or three arms or the hole for where the head goes through isn't big enough, then even though the fabric or the knitting or whatever it is about it that you like is really good, if the form isn't right, it's not functional. Now, in music, we build form with three processes. We state something and then we either repeat it or we vary it, or we do something that's different than that, contrast. Um, let me give you an example of that. So here's some notation, and I don't expect you to be able to read this in the class necessarily, but we do know that this means that it's going down and then back up and then down back up, and if you've done your rhythm, you'll know that this note is longer than that note, and these notes are the same. This is actually a very familiar tune. It goes like this. And that's actually built by repetition. 
And then the end of it is contrasting. Something different, okay? And that's the first idea. So even inside just this is an idea on its own, we have repetition, repetition, and then contrast. Now the next phrase or idea that answers that is notated right here. And you can see that the pitches are different, but listen to it. Notice that the rhythms are the same. The values of the notes are the same in terms of how long they are and where they are. And if you look, it's repetition, 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 and then contrast. But if we were to compare this versus that, they're rhythmically the same. They're just flipped upside down. This one goes down, up, down, up, down, up, up, up. This one goes down, up, down, up, down, down, down.